Hi, my name's Aiden, here to do a behind the bumpers on your Archimedes Captain of Alliance 2, 1987 Broncobots and their robot Riptide with their expanding funnel and their spring-loaded algae manipulator. This video on fun is brought to you by viewers like you and also in partnership with the following. Build your alliance with so many other FIRST alumni who go to Kettering University. Every student at Kettering experiences their cutting-edge co-op programs that seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds. Kettering co-ops are a fully immersive working experience at the leading edge of industry. Head on over to kettering.edu slash FIRST to learn more about their incredible programs and to get more information. Earn up to a $5,000 sponsorship for your team or $2,000 individual price when you provide a video submission to the Altair Global Student Contest at altair.com slash contest. You can build better robots faster with Altair tools and provide multiple video submissions for the contest. Download Altair tools for free. Scan the QR code or go to altair.com slash contest for further details. Let's take it away to Frank to talk about the intake. Yeah, so here we have our human player intake. And so at the beginning of the season, our design and strategy team, strategy team decided to go with a human player intake as opposed to a ground intake. And our intake has seen many changes throughout the season. Originally, it was completely passive, as in it was not motorized or anything. But one of our like team philosophies is that if you touch something, you own it. And so when we like go ahead and get Coral into our intake, we should immediately get it, which goes into our end effector. And so. Uh, about this intake, it is driven by a Kraken X44 motor at the bottom, as well as belts that run to control the star wheels. And so essentially the coral will kind of finagle a bit and then go right into the end effector. One cool thing about this intake is how it expands. Here we have magnets on this 3D print. And so when we essentially eject coral into our intake, our intake will expand just like that. And that is due to the fact that when coral is completely inside the intake, the coral will lay perfectly fat, flat. And so we actually found this to be like a fluke when we first designed the intake, being that the coral would not lay completely flat. And so after uh, some testing and right before our first event, we decided to incorporate this feature, not just uh, for just how the intake like you know works, but just to make it easier. And along with that, our intake still stays completely within frame perimeter because we know we can catch penalties if we have anything that extends outside the robot. And so, and over the course of the season, we continue to add some more like features uh, such as these panels here, which help like, you know, you eject coral in there. It's like essentially like a buffer. But another cool thing about the intake is kind of like these brushes, even though it might look like Sonic the Hedgehog, these brushes actually play a critical role in how we play in a match, as in it prevents bounce outs. And so these brushes essentially prevent bounce outs so we can be more reliable and have just, you know, reliable cycling since we can't pick up any coral off the ground. And continuing that, we do have these brackets on the side here just to provide some structure and some stability. And so just continuing on that, we wanted to make our intake as robust as possible because we know that without an intake or without a functional intake, we cannot operate in a match, which is how you know, we are able to perform at a high level in which after coral is, you know, ejected into the intake, it goes right into our end effector. You want to perform an intake sequence? All right. All right, now we're going to go on to Corbin to talk about the end effector and the climber. Yeah, so it looks a little complicated, but this is actually a pretty simple mechanism. Like Frank talked about, the goal of the coral is to get it to lay on it down here in the intake. And then... Good night. What's up? And then the intake, this, this went through a lot of iterations, but eventually we settled on this simple design. It's just a wedge with some client compliant wheels. That goes back to our touch it and own it um, policy, where we always want to have complete control over that game piece. So we're using these screen um, compliant wheels and this little nose here always funnels the coral straight into this wedge, ensuring it always goes straight into the end effector whenever it comes in. 
And then we actually designed this at the beginning of the season when we um, decided we wanted to, you know, play well around defense, move fast. We don't want to flip our arm into a wall, into another robot. So we actually designed this to flip through our intake. Just keep it fast, keep it simple. And then we can go straight over to score, which is um, has helped us a lot in our quick cycle times. And then we also decided we wanted to be able to do everything off one mechanism. So we're using WCP max composite plates here. And this is, a, this is our spring-loaded algae arm. We will actually run the coral infector in reverse. And this will just force an algae in off the reef. We collect off the reef and open up this arm. And then to eject, the springs will push down on that algae and just toss it into the net. So we can't draw penalties because we never get close enough to the net or the barge to um, touch it or draw those penalties. All right, going on to Preston to talk about the elevator and a few other things. So you'll notice that everything on that controls this arm and the arm itself is super lightweight. So basically we cheesed out everything on this that moves. And the goal for this is to make it as lightweight as possible to be able to move it as fast as possible and get low cycle times. So the way this arm rotates is we have this coaxial gearbox and this allows us to not have any motors on the arm and again keep it lightweight and so basically like on the carriage of this elevator we have two motors and one motor will control the rotation of the arm and the other controls all the wheels on the arm so that's kind of the coaxial system and Basically, the one that controls the arm is fed through this chain. It has this gearbox down here, and the gearbox down there is floating. So basically, we can move the entire gearbox to be able to tension this chain. And then the other one is just driven through this belt right here into these gears, and it goes off to two points, one to control the LG arm right here, and the other to control uh, this end effector right here. And the elevator that we have is a three-stage continuously rigged elevator. And again, everything is super cheesed out and super light. So if you notice on the side of these tubes, we have most of the material cut away to make it as light as possible. All right, we're gonna go back to Corbin to talk about the climber. All right, so we're gonna deploy the climber real quick. So we took in for we took inspiration from Rembrandt this season, and we use a um, small 10-pound gas shock here in the back. It's just nestled right there along the frame, and it goes straight up to the climber. And then we have a um, 1 to 144 winch that pulls back the climber. And that allows us to make a quick climb there at the end. Yeah. And that is way more than enough to pull us up at the end. But do you want to deploy it again? So we took inspiration from the EveryBot this year, just a simple, just a simple clamp, um, rubber band loaded clamp. We've used rubber bands in the past. We used them to climb last year. So we thought, hey, it's pretty simple, pretty easy. Let's just do it again. And we actually chose this robot archetype to be able to fit a climber. We were originally gonna go with more of a cranberry alarm style where we feed into an elevator, pass through the elevator and onto the reef. But we couldn't figure out how to fit a climber in with that. So we went with the sideways elevator and the funnel. But even then we were still kind of size constrained. So we had to do something that would fit in with the funnel, but not hit our arm here. Cause you know, it sticks out a lot from the elevator. So we came up with this and even now it only has about an inch of clearance off both systems when we climb on the cage, but it fits and 
we haven't made any changes since. But um, we have these things down here, these sensors, um, laser can sensors. We've cut holes in our grip tape here, so when um, we have both arms of the cage, both sensors will enable a rumble on the driver controller and let the driver know when, hey, you have the cage and you can climb, you won't break anything. And here, this kind of W-shaped looking thing, this will actually slide the cage along and into position. A lot of um, thought went into the design behind that. A lot of CAD, how to get this W perfectly, um, perfect to be able to slide that cage in. But yeah, it slides in, comes in here, and then we just climb. Down here, if you look, it's um, the winch is tied to the belly pan on a one eighth two by one. And that's where our line weight sits. It's just in the center of the robot way down low. And yeah, you can also see it's nestled around our battery. That was another issue with the size and strength of this robot. It's a very small robot. So we had to um, make some weird design choices to get everything to fit. And this is one of them. So this actually, let's deploy it again. To get the battery in and out, we actually have to take the winch off and stick it in there. But yeah, that's our climber. All right, on to Christopher to talk about what really makes a robot run, the electrical, the programming, and of course, the autos at the start. All right, so we're gonna start with what we intended to do this season. And we were trying to focus on automation as this game is very important when it comes to having preset positions to score in and doing that extremely fast in order to score. So that being Coral. So let's start with vision. Uh, as Corbin just explained, our limelight, primary, our primary limelight is this one right here on the front. And this, whenever we are in a scoring position, aims at our reef. And that can see in very, very high quality an April tag on the reef. And so what we can do from that is we can get a bot pose estimation from this guy, return that to the Rio, and then we can calculate in real time where we are on the field, and then we can uh, perform decisions based off of that information. So come over here and I'll show you what poses we can drive to on the field at any given time. Right here on the screen, you can see every pose that we have computed that we will ever need to go to to score, collect, or you know, play on the field. So we've got intake positions, scoring positions on the reef, uh, scoring positions for the net, scoring positions for climbing. Literally anything that he could ever want to drive through is programmed in here and he's got a button to go to it. <sighs> okay, so let's talk about some hardware mechanics before we get into how the software works. On our LG end effector and coral end effector, we have three Kian's proc sensors. So these little guys are very small, very compact, and they detect whether something is close enough to them within a certain range, and they will trigger based off of that, if you can see the light. Uh, this one we have set up for a convenience feature where if we need to move this arm, we can put our finger on it and it will let us move the arm very easily uh, for setting up our preload. So that is how we detect whether or not we have an algae or a coral in the robot. The other limelight we have on this robot is over here on the intake side. That is a limelight 3G, and that is used to detect the limelight or the April tags on the coral stations. So we can know where we are even if we're not close to the reef, which is important for intaking accurately. Okay, software mechanics. We are using a state-based robot project, and what that allows us to do is have infinitely possible robot states um, that we can switch to at any given time, which allows us to have a certain behavior of the robot that we can choose. The thing that most people do, don't do with state machines is that they don't have the robot calculate its own state. That is what we did with this year with the April tags and the sensors. So depending on what the robot is currently, what's currently in the robot, where the robot currently is, all of the properties of the robot, we use that and we calculate a state. And that state is used to determine whether or not, you know, he's got a coral, he's trying to score a coral, and it gives him completely different controls for whatever state he may be in. So it's a very intuitive system and it makes his life as our driver very easy. Uh, that was primarily the goal with our automation this year. And I think we pulled it off. So into the world of our amazing autos. Uh, we've always, at the Broncobots, always tried to have a very strong autonomous game, and that continues for this year. We use Pathfinder in addition to some custom commands we've created, uh, and we've generated some autos like this one. So we talked to our strategy team, they told us what they wanted out of our auto, and then we tried our best to execute. So what we have here is a triple L4 auto. Now this auto actually tries to score four pieces. Unfortunately, the robot's not quite fast enough to do that, but sometimes we can get that fourth piece. So we have similar ones for 
L4 on the alternative side, so this will score on the front side of the reef instead of on the, I guess, left side of the reef. Um, and what's really cool about this is if we, for instance, missed one of those L4s, it would not try to score. It wouldn't raise the elevator, it would just stop, drive back to save time and guarantee a three piece, which is, you know, very beneficial when you're trying to get every single point you can out of auto. So here's an algae auto we have. This one starts in the middle, scores an L4, then grabs that algae, scores it in the net. One more algae. And then heads to the uh, station to start collecting that algae. So, and then my personal favorite auto. We have n sadly not been able to use this one, but it does exist. So we're going to score that algae, head over to our opposing alliance, yoink that algae, and then park. But yes, through a combination of conditional statements, um, bot pose estimations, and you know, just lots of time and effort. We've created some pretty strong autos for this event. All right, this has been Behind the Bumpers on Team 1987 Bronco Bots and their machine, Riptide. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and click the bell to stay up to date on future fun videos. Earn up to a $5,000 sponsorship for your team or $2,000 individual prize when you provide a video submission to the Altair Global Student Contest at altair.com slash contest. You can build better robots faster with Altair tools and provide multiple video submissions for the contest. Download Altair tools for free, scan the QR code, or go to altair.com slash contest for further details. Build your alliance with so many other FIRST alumni who go to Kettering University. Every student at Kettering experiences their cutting-edge co-op programs that seamlessly blend the professional and academic worlds. Kettering co-ops are a fully immersive working experience at the leading edge of industry. Head on over to kettering.edu first to learn more about their incredible programs and to get more information.